Um, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this webinar hosted by Climate Strategies on bridging justice and adaptation, synergies between just transitions and the global goal on adaptation. This is a highly relevant topic uh, because adaptation is an urgent global challenge. And just like mitigation, it can create mediated impacts on the livelihoods of the most vulnerable. My name is Ana Gonzalez. I am Program and Networks Associate at Climate Strategies. For those who are not familiar with climate strategies yet, we are an international not-for-profit research network working on bridging the gap between climate research and policy alongside our members who are leading climate researchers from all around the world. Climate Strategies has worked extensively in just transitions for the past decade across a variety of sectors and geographies. Uh, for many countries, this concept has evolved and expanded to not only cover mitigation, but also adaptation. Yet the focus of just transitions is still skewed towards mitigation, including at UNFCCC level. In that sense, this event falls under the umbrella of our South to South Just Transitions program, which over the last five years has supported researchers from nine countries in the global South uh, to build capacity on just transitions and to bring their research to the forefront of climate negotiations. Currently, uh, this initiative is spearheading research focusing on justice in adaptation to understand what just resilience means in global South contexts and to identify national priorities. We are only now beginning to develop a collective understanding of the justice and equity implications of climate adaptation policy. And there is growing evidence that some adaptation efforts do the opposite of what they intended, which is known as maladaptation, resulting in unequal and unjust outcomes that redistribute climate risk rather than reducing it. This is why today we are exploring the intersection of justice and adaptation to help find synergies that will enhance justice and equity, thus bringing us closer to achieving just resilience on a global scale. To help us navigate today's topics, we have a remarkable lineup of speakers, who we're, and we're very grateful for them. Uh, we will start with a presentation to set the scene on integrating just transition lens into climate change adaptation planning and implementation from Susanna Fisher, Principal Research Fellow um, uh, at the University College London. Uh, then we will hear from our esteemed panelists who will explore the intersection between justice and climate change adaptation for, from their unique backgrounds and expertise. In the panel, we have Catherine Goldberg, Senior Climate Policy Advisor at the US Department of State, Gina Stierfuchel, I, I hope I'm saying the last name correctly, Associate Professor in the Department of Environmental and Geographical Science of the University of Cape Town, Joshua Amundsen, founder of the Green Africa Youth Organization and co-director for the Youth Climate Justice Fund, and Rebecca Carter, Director for Climate Adaptation and Resilience at the World Resource Institute. Without further ado, uh, I'm giving the floor to our first speaker. Uh, welcome, Susanna. Thank you so much. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit today about justice and equity in adaptation and to set the scene for um, this great panel to follow, um, introducing some of the ideas that we've seen at the international level around the global goal on adaptation, adaptation finance, and how this might intersect with the just transition. So there is a rapidly closing window to act and impacts are being felt now. So I think this has to be the context for, for any of our conversations today that we've seen this year just in 2024, extreme heat waves, flooding events on different continents, cyclones, really significant impacts being felt by marginalized communities around the world. And that's in combination with what we know from the latest science from the IPCC reports that climate change is a threat to human well-being and the health of the planet and we have a brief and rapidly closing window to secure a livable future. So the things we're talking about are not things of the future, they're issues that are really affecting people today. But before we go on, I want you to set the scene in terms of how we might think about justice. But there are many ways of thinking about environmental justice, and I think three elements could be particularly important for our conversations today. So firstly is this idea of distribution. How are the costs and benefits of adaptation distributed? And how does this relate to who has caused or is causing the problem of climate change? And then we have the second element of recognition. 
who are recognized as valid participants in the process of defining adaptation policies, putting in place programs, or indeed being part of a just transition or a resilient transition process. And then related to recognition, how are different groups engaged in those processes and what power and agency do they have to shape um, these processes that will have significant effects on their lives? And I would say that we're seeing a lack of justice across all, the, all three areas in adaptation at the moment, and perhaps through an intersection with these ideas of the just transition, we might find some ways of addressing these. So one of the key things we often talk about with adaptation is the finance. And I think this is a key justice issue that we can't ignore. There is simply not enough money going into international adaptation and costs are about 10 to 18 times as much as the current flows. But beyond even the issue of how much money there is, it's really hard to access and harder to access for countries that are already struggling with lower capacities or lower financial resources. And what there is has often led to incremental and sometimes, but not always, ineffective adaptation action. So we're in a context where not enough is happening and what is happening, we're still learning how to do it. And that's an important process that we need to go through. And the other thing I want to talk about in this slide is we also need to look beyond what we define as adaptation and the adaptation finance sector, that actually lots of climate risks are locked in for people from the wider political and economic systems that they live in, far beyond what we define as an adaptation program. For example, the position of farmers within the global food system or how people are able to be mobile in different contexts after a disaster. So there are far wider issues of procedure and recognition for people living in their communities today than just how much they're involved in their adaptation. There's these wider issues about the systems that are locking in climate risk. To address some of these issues, um, countries and parties through the UNFCCC put in place something called the Global Goal on Adaptation, which they hoped would raise the profile and ambition of adaptation and put it on a par with mitigation to give countries and the international community something like the temperature limit to, to aim to and aspire to and to ensure that we were on track. So Article 7.1 of the Paris Agreement calls for establishing the global goal that will enhance adaptive capacity, strengthen resilience and reduce vulnerability to climate change. And those conversations have been developing over the last few years through something called the Glasgow Sharmal Sheikh Work Program and culminated in Dubai in COP28 in the UAE Framework for Global Climate Resilience. And this framework lays out four process targets around the adaptation planning cycle and seven thematic targets for where the world might hope to get to on adaptation. But this really lays out the big picture, the goals. It doesn't go into the details of how this might happen. And there's now a more detailed work program that's looking at indicators. But this will always be a larger norm setting process at the global level, rather than something that can directly influence um, national action. So how might these ideas of adaptation um, and the global goal on adaptation intersect with the other topic we're talking about, way, the just transition? So, as I said, the global goal on adaptation is really a big picture image of where the world might seek to go to and how we might know if we are achieving it. But the pathway to get there is uncertain. And as we've seen from some of those initial thoughts on adaptation, it can often be very political who gets involved in the decisions, where the finance goes and how effective those programs are. So within that context, we might think about the just transition or ideas from the just transition as helping inform the pathways to achieving a just global goal. And on this slide, I have just some of the risks that I think we need to situate this conversation in to think about what a just adaptation transition might look like. So some of the emerging research on agriculture, for example, suggests that some areas of the world will become increasingly difficult to grow crops in, and they're moving outside what might be defined as a safe climatic space. That will be a very different future, depending on the temperature where we're ultimately able to stabilize. But these are important considerations to think about in helping people adapt to a future. At the same time, thinking about the just transition puts a real emphasis on work and decent work. And how will people be affected by the changing uh, climate impacts and how they're able to do their jobs? We know that heat stress has a major impact on labor productivity and the ability of people to work outside to work long hours, and impacts on their mental and their physical health. 
And thirdly, we also know that some people feel like they're not part of this movement going forward, that they are somehow left out of what a just transition or a just adaptation response might be. And we've perhaps seen the example in Europe of farmers who've been really um, protesting against something called the nature restoration law, feeling that it was too difficult on top of many other challenges that they already face. So part of a just transition modality or thinking about adaptation that way is also thinking about who needs to be brought along on the journey to understand where the new opportunities might be and to be compensated where some of these risks might mean they can no longer continue to work and live as they've done in the past. So I want to just end with three reflections that I think who gets to define and shape our understanding of what is resilient and transformative is key for how we think about justice across the global goal, but also across a just resilient transition. What is resilient and transformative is not necessarily the same in each context, and we need to be really alert to who gets to define those ideas and in what ways. Secondly, I think the idea of compensation, whether that's in a political term, but thinking about how to support and bring people along in coalitions could be an interesting part to think about um, in adaptation. How do we protect people who are going to need it, as well as building those coalitions of the willing for the political change that we need to see? And I think linked to those is this point about we need to adapt not just to what we're seeing now, but also to these upcoming risks. And keep in mind there's potential higher warming scenarios, worst case, not necessarily worst case scenarios, but of course we don't want to get there. But what would happen if we would? And how could we think about what a transformative, inclusive transition might look like in those contexts? Okay, so I hope that's provided a little bit of food for thought. I'm now gonna hand back to my uh, colleagues. Thank you so much, Susanna, for your presentations. It, your presentation is actually a great segue to hear from our panelists. Our knowledgeable panel will now discuss on how the principles of just transition can be effectively integrated into global climate adaptation to ensure equitable outcomes that increase resilience. We will start with Catherine Goldberg from the US Department of State. Welcome, Catherine. Thanks, Anna, and thanks uh, to the Climate Strategies team for having me. It's a really great topic and a, and a great set of speakers. Um, and I think Dr. Fisher's presentation uh, sets me up very well <laughs> for some of my comments. Um, I wanted to focus on some of the challenges and opportunities that uh, we from the U.S. have experienced in integrating just transition into adaptation planning, both domestically and abroad. Um, as well as some of the opportunities to discuss this intersection of adaptation and just transition under the UN climate negotiations, uh, which is really where my area of expertise is. I'm our just transition negotiator for the US. Um, so it, the good thing in our view is that we really don't need any new um, buzzwords or criteria or principles for just transition and adaptation as compared to just transition and mitigation. Um, and that's because a lot of the elements in just transition planning and mitigation really are the same ones that come into play when, when you uh, do just transition planning and adaptation. And I'll, I'll go through some of those in a minute. Um, and a lot of those aspects also directly relate or are pulled from the ILO's guidance on just transition. Um, which for us in the U.S. has kind of been a cornerstone of a lot of our uh, certainly domestic policies when we try to integrate opportunities for workers and for communities impacted by the transition to net zero. Um, so a lot of the elements that we have found effective, um, and this is kind of my challenges and opportunities <laughs> pitch, I guess, um, a lot of these are both opportunities and, and also challenges. Challenges to effectively integrating just transition considerations in both adaptation and mitigation planning. For us, um, again, domestically and abroad have included things like a no one size fits all approach. Um, even in the US, we have cities and states with extremely different backgrounds and needs. Um, uh, so it's, it's difficult to say that one type of just transition adaptation planning works for you know, for Washington, D.C. versus for San Francisco or some state in between or some city in between. Um, obviously, on the international scale, that's even more uh, even more differences. Um, another key opportunity and, and also challenge is this dimension of social dialogue and engagement of stakeholders and in particular the most vulnerable. Um, 
that's challenging to do from a practical standpoint. It's, you know, it's hard to go out into these communities and talk to people. Um, it's resource intensive, but it's a huge opportunity because that's what gets you the just transition. It's when you talk to those people um, who, are, are, who are hardest hit by the impacts of climate change and when you make sure that your adaptation um, efforts are really tailored towards uh, helping those people and, and making sure their unique needs are met. Um, part of that is um, consideration of how to develop a climate ready workforce in the adaptation context. And domestically, we've done this um, in particular through a program called the American Climate Corps, which was launched by President Biden earlier this year. It's training about 20,000 Americans, young people um, to uh, fight climate change and, and also to contribute to clean energy and adaptation related jobs in the future. Internationally, we've supported something called the Cairo Center for Learning and Excellence on Adaptation and Resilience, which um, provides training for practitioners all across Africa on implementing effective adaptation and resilience strategies. Um, finally, just to pivot to the opportunities to discuss some of this overlap in the, in the UN climate space, I mean, I think, um, Dr. Fisher highlighted well the, the GGA framework and um, the, the decision that came out of Dubai last year includes a link, uh, a direct mention of adaptive social protection, which I think is a clear hook to discuss the just transition um, intersection with adaptation. Obviously also under the just transition work program, this is a topic that could be further elaborated on and uh, you know, we as, as the U.S. have supported this as a topic, adaptation, climate resilient, just transitions um, as something to further under, unpack in that work program. So I'm hopeful that this year we start to do more of that. Thanks. Thank you so much, Catherine, uh, for your intervention. And indeed, as you say, uh, the stakeholder engagement is what gets you to the just transition. So and that links very well what Susanna was saying, and because indeed, then that gives us who gets to define and shape our understandings. So yeah, we definitely have to do more uh, stakeholder engagements. Um, so uh, I would like now to give the floor to uh, Gina from the University of Cape Town. Welcome, Thank Gina. You. Thank you all and really good uh, to be here. Um, so I'm going to start with one little provocation before I move on to a bit more about my kind of work that I do. And the first is that we need to start with ourselves as researchers and practitioners and ask hard questions about our role and research in relation to justice and climate change adaptation. So I encourage us all, if we're working in the space, to start by asking, what privilege do I have? How am I using it? Am I trying to hold on to power? And how might I shift the status quo to give more power to some of those I'm working with who typically have less power? Um, these are hard conversations, and so we need to create safe spaces for them. But we really need to do this with our teams and collaborators. And then I want to talk about adaptation in the context of cities, because that is my... Um, uh, research focus. And what I've seen is that often local governments um, are trying to reduce exposure to climate risk and support service delivery at the city level. And so decisions are often made from the perspective of the city level and what is be best at that scale. And the focus on who's most vulnerable and how this might change their climate risk is often secondary. So the first challenge that um, I've noticed is how to bring in considerations of equity early on in policy and planning. And I've worked with some philosophy colleagues actually at Warwick University to develop a framework for ethical deliberation. So often attention's not paid to the ethics around adaptation decision-making and should be. So this helps policymakers to think through their options and what the ethics around those are and what they are actually choosing rather than not thinking through um, those eth ethical issues. Um, and then I have two challenges that I put together and I'll respond to together is challenge two is ensuring that the realities around lived experience are considered in adaptation interventions, which links to the previous two speakers about who gets to define what is resilient. We need to listen to people who are vulnerable um, and exposed. And challenge three is a lack of meaningful collaboration across scales and actor groups. 
And so often what I've seen is there's insufficient data and information about the lived experience and how adaptation interventions have or might impact on daily lives. But if we want to influence distributive justice, we need to be engaging with these experiences. And so in the case of Cape Town, um, where I work in South Africa, I've worked with local social movements and NGOs to understand uh, their lived experience around water access, particularly in relation to the Cape Town drought. And through a very kind of collaborative co-production process, we brought in city officials who were very interested in this data, but we really stalled when trying to find ways to integrate this local lived experience in city decision-making and responses. And this links to some of the concerns um, that inform my work on transformative urban climate adaptation and social justice, where I'm really trying to explore cross-scalar governance in relation to how local groups and communities engage with local government and how local government engages with communities. And I believe that by st strengthening collaborative governance, adaptation outcomes can be strengthened at both the city um, and the local level. And although local governments have tried to enable participation, it's usually been insufficient and limited in terms of the ideals of procedural justice. But I think it's really exciting because they're growing numbers example of examples of co-production. And for me, these need to include a focus on epistemic justice and making sure we recognize the knowledge of different groups and really value these different perspectives. But the reality is that many government officials aren't skilled in facilitation and don't have resources, so it often relies on individual projects, and we really need to scale up some of this engagement to get the local perspective. And so um, to end, I just want to say that building trust, I think, is central to the just transition. So we've seen coal mining towns in South Africa where mines are closing, but they don't trust the government or private sector. So how can one collaboratively build a just transition away from coal? How can one support a just transition towards a more adapted city if the most marginalized are not really listened to and their challenges are not surfaced? So it takes time, humility and resources, and we need to start now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gina. And, um, and thank you also for your provocation at the beginning. We really do need to start looking at ourselves first to, to, to start seeing what we need to. And we would love to hear more about the framework of ethical considerations, if you can share later um, your research on that. Um, so yeah, definitely. Uh, building trust uh, is key. And so that is a great segue to give the word to Joshua Amponsen from the Green African Youth Organization. Thank you, Joshua. Thanks. Um, it, it's really amazing to be here, and uh, thanks to Clement Stratis for putting this together. Um, very amazing to hear from Susanna, Catherine, and Gina, uh, and the amazing work that you do. I will start with you not know, building upon the provocation from Gina and saying that when we started the work at Green Africa Youth Organization as a youth movement, um, and when we got exposure to the international space, one of the first things we realized very quickly was that almost every fundamental work that happened at the international level, in forums, uh, in big meetings, all of that is using the narratives and the story of people who are really on the front lines and facing the impact. That is everyone's argument. If we do not do this, people are going to die and they're going to experience you know, extreme heat, they're going to experience floods. And this became a very sort of present thing. And, and as Susanna said, it's no longer about the future, it is about now. Uh, and that became a very strong reality in every single room that you go. But in doing that, we also saw that most importantly, it's also a way for organizations to gather resources and to really provide arguments for the work that they do. And I think this is why Gina's point is so, so important. How do we really create organizations, institutions that seek to really distribute that power that access um so this is where i come from in the work that i do with young people looking at the future that is ahead of us and how do we resource young people and communities on the front line and talking about you know adaptation and uh, equity and justice um after many years of working in this field i realized that philanthropy and funding is one of the cancers within this space that is really deep rooted in a way that it's constantly keep taking resources away from people who really need their resources to work so we set up the Youth Climate Justice Fund, and one of the first things we did was taking uh, data from all the big philanthropies uh, uh, within the climate field and understanding how much of their funding actually goes to grassroots communities and those on the front line, and particularly youth movements. And we saw that only 0.76 of grants that were given by these 
uh, entities were going, particularly to those uh, on frontline communities in the global south. Uh, in addition to that, most of these groups are lacking the support, the connectivity, and the capacity development, or even the trust and flexible funding mechanisms with the money that is given to them. So if the money is given, it's given very restricted and really forcing them to do uh, a project activities that is more towards the strategy of a philanthropic actor as opposed to what they actually believe in, which shouldn't be the case. Uh, so with that work, we also realize that when it comes to the ground, adaptation, mitigation, climate action as a broader word, it's not so in these boxes for communities, right? It's almost intersectional on the ground. And I really agree with Catherine's point around, you know, we don't need new terminologies. We just need to face the fact that at the end of the day, people think about the now. Of course, they care about the future. And to Susanna's point, you know, the farmers are not going to really care about this big grand just transition plan 50 years from now if they don't see themselves having a life for themselves and their children five years ahead of them. And this is really, really important. And we really need to, need to focus on that. So when we created our organization, one of the few things that we thought about in doing this were five key uh, processes that we use as the fund in working on advising philanthropic entities, advising funders and donors about the way they work. And one of them is building access and conditions for meaningful participation. And, and that is fundamentally saying that you need to be able to provide space for whoever, whichever partner you're working with on the ground that you so much care about, you're so much talking about them all the time, that their leadership can actually be available when there is space for conversations as opposed to representing them. And this became very important to us and meaningful participation also means that being able to help them prepare and to capacity development as part of that work. The second part is intersectionality uh, as the, at the heart of the work that we do. And I think that we shouldn't really keep going on these buckets and silos of work. We, we need to realize that, you know, waste management has implications on health, on education, on well-being, And this really intersects with climate in many different ways. And I think that when communities really talk about what they care about the most, we need to focus on that and support them on that, as opposed to really coming back to our very strict strategies that we have in big organizations. The third part is solidarity and accountability to ourselves not so much to communities on the ground. And I've seen this so much that it's always that accountability is applied on the person receiving the money, but not the person giving the money. And I don't think that should necessarily be the case. I think that the one who is stressed on the ground, who is really struggling, right, to come through the impact they are facing should not be given additional stress on so much of this accountability, you know, and so much we need to look at it from ourselves as entities, funders, as you know, philanthropic actors, as big research institutions, universities. How are we holding ourselves accountable? How are we applying research or conducting research in global South countries? But we know that the money is sitting in our accounts. We know that we are the lead authors. We know that we are the lead publishers. How do we think about these things and start giving that power back to those who really live this reality? So that is something that is super important. And then... Uh, one thing that we also thought about, which Gina really said a lot, is trust as an outcome of all the work that we do. And I wouldn't even go detail in explaining it. And then the last part is humility of our work, which is something that we really think is very important. How can we really enter this field with humility, recognizing that while for some organizations and institutions, this is the work that we do, and we carry a burden for that, how do you also ensure that for some people, this is also life and death? right? The ability to build resilience or to adapt to the next heat wave or to the next flood and will determine whether they have a chance for tomorrow or not. And really thinking about that and bringing that to this, to the work that we do becomes very important. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Joshua, for your intervention. Uh, very insightful indeed. It, it, it is true that adaptation is happening all the time, whether we plan it or not plan it and whether it's just or unjust. So um, yeah, that is that is definitely something we need to consider, and and I something that keeps indeed coming up all the time is these but uh, top down approaches that just don't work, and and we should definitely be uh, reconsidering that and and start co creating more rather than imposing. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, and uh, well, last but not least, I would like to give the floor to Rebecca Carter from the World Research Institute. Thank you, Rebecca. Welcome. Thank you. Really great to be here today. Very much appreciate the uh, the invitation, and it's kind of nice to be wrapping up, you know, the final presentation and what I think is going to lead off um, a very interesting discussion. So what I would like to propose for my answer to how can justice considerations be effectively integrated into climate adaptation strategies to ensure equitable and resilient outcomes, 
are that the principles for locally led adaptation are closely aligned with the just transition principles, but they may be more helpful in some ways because they are specifically tailored for adaptation. Um, I put a link to them in the, in the chat there. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with them, they were created uh, a couple of years ago during the Global Commission on Adaptation, um, WRI and, and several partners came together on them. And, you know, I think it's not an overstatement to say that there is really a movement behind these principles by this point um, and a movement toward putting local communities in the driver's seat when it comes to implementing national level adaptation plans and policies in just, equitable and inclusive ways. Um, at this point, the principles have been endorsed by 135 entities, and those include 20 national government entities. Um, USAID was an early endorser back at COP26. South Africa's Presidential Climate Change Commission has endorsed them. Um, nearly all of the major bilateral and multilateral adaptation funding entities have endorsed them. So I feel like there's a, a movement coalescing around some of these principles. And just to point out a couple of them, there are eight, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to walk you through each one. But um, those that I would say align most closely with the uh, just transition principles are that they both talk about addressing stru structural inequalities faced by women, youth, children, um, other marginalized groups. They both talk about ensuring transparency and accountability um, for locally led adaptation. It's specifically to local stakeholders. And, you know, for those of you who have been working on adaptation for a while, I mean, I think, you know, you know, I think you're very aware that it's one thing for a national government to put together a plan, a policy, a, an NDC. It's a whole nother thing to have it implemented at the local level. I mean, Joshua talked about how the funding rarely makes it to the local level, and that is certainly a big challenge as well. But it is very much local people who are going to actually have to do something different in many cases in their day to day lives to be able to implement adaptation. Um, you know, and that means that it's local governments, institutions, civil society groups communities of all kinds of businesses that will really have to take action to implement adaptation plans and policies. So some of the parts of these uh, locally led adaptation principles that are more adaptation specific include building a robust understanding of climate risk and uncertainty, but also devolving decision-making power to the lowest appropriate level. So this is not just participatory adaptation where maybe you have a workshop and local people can attend the workshop and hear about the plans. It's more than, you know, just kind of giving a voice to local communities. It's meant to put them in the driver's seat. And I think it could actually be quite transformative if implemented because it flips the power dynamic on its head. Um, it says that local communities should have decision-making authority and budgetary authority about what happens in their communities, what they think is gonna work best, um, how it gets implemented, who implements it, and also how it's monitored and evaluated, You know, who decides whether or not adaptation is successful. It really puts local actors in the driver's seat. Um, to share just a, a very timely example here, um, there's a report coming out today just by coincidence that WRI drafted for South Africa's Presidential Climate Change Commission on the state of climate action in South Africa. And I'll put a link in the chat in just a second. But some of the findings from this were that, you know, South Africa really does consider the significant risks that it's facing from extreme climate change impacts. and that national policies and commitments have set out a comprehensive approach to building climate resilience, but implementation of these commitments has been sluggish. So for example, we found that only 28 out of the 95 actions outlined in the National Cl Climate Change Adaptation Strategy were listed as being fully implemented or currently being implemented. But the good news is that just a few days ago, South African President Cyril Rambo ramp up FOSA, uh, signed into law a broad climate change act that will set caps for large emitters, right, so the mitigation part, but also require that every town and city publish an adaptation plan. And to me, this is locally led adaptation in action. And again, this is the key to integrating climate justice into adaptation. Um, I would like to say just, I, I know we're very short on time, but I wanted to just specifically mention the funding because it is where 
the rubber meets the road in so many ways. So several of these locally led adaptation principles are geared toward addressing these challenges. And they include things like providing patient and predictable funding that can be accessed more easily, investing in local capabilities to leave an institutional legacy, flexible programming and learning, and collaborative action and investment. So, you know, I wanted to put this on the table because I do think that um, just listening to the other presenters, we all want the same thing and we're all, all aiming toward the same goals, you know, and the um, our organizers today, I think we're really trying to hit at this very important question. But, you know, I do wonder if maybe these principles for locally led adaptation might give us a bit more specificity. And it's still a lot of work to implement these principles to action on the ground. But, you know, with the movement that they have behind them, um, all of those endorsers I mentioned, there's now, now the emphasis is on, okay, we've said we want to do this, but how do we do this, right? So, you know, figuring out what guidance for implementation looks like, I think is where the real action is going to be and figuring out how to get the, the funding and the finance to the local level so that this can actually happen. And I will stop there. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for your intervention. And indeed, I guess maybe a, a starting point to, to implementation is also having these conversations that are happening at the international level and at the national level to actually be tailored and reflecting the national, the local realities of, of the people, because definitely the conversations happening and the policy making happening at one level do not reflect anything that is happening at local levels and where adaptation is actually being led. So um, thank you so much for that. Um, I see a lot of questions already coming into the chat. So for the sake of time, I will um, go already into some of the questions. Um, I see from Sunny Musa. Um, there's a few questions. I will um, allow one of them um, so that we have time for, for questions from other people coming. Um, so. One of the questions is how can we balance the need for rapid adaptation with the need for inclusive participatory decision-making processes? Um, so anyone, please feel free to jump in. I'll probably jump in. Um, I think that is, is really tough. And I've seen that in most cases, for instance, the development of the national adaptation plans um, or even city level uh, resilience strategies were very much done with just a bunch of you know technocrats or just government officials with no consultations to local communities because there's no time for it but also whoever is provided the financing for that did not take into consideration the cost of consultation right and i think this is for me the main point if you want to really balance that the, the need for it and the rapid need and the scale of it, we need to make sure that the financing for this also takes into consideration the cost of consulting people. It is not a very easy thing to do, actually. And that's why most you know entities, governments, and even NGOs sometimes don't do it because it's human interaction. And human interaction is very difficult. You're going to have a lot of friction, a lot of education to get people on the same page. Uh, and that can be quite uh, expensive uh, uh, in different ways. So I think that that for me, the first step would be how do we cost things appropriately, um, which is very important, but also how do we make sure that adaptation is not seen as an alien thing that is to be done and we need a whole new process for it? How do we make it part of the existing efforts that all these communities and existing staff uh, in, in local government offices are already part of? And I've seen a real example where you have an ongoing consultation for SDGs, and then there has to be a separate one that needs to be done particularly for saying at zero or for, you know, adaptation. And that is just burdening people and staff within these offices. How do we make sure that we can have a comprehensive approach right upon the existing effort that are already there and use the same processes to, to gather data and uh, consult to make sure that uh, the development is more inclusive. And while I have the mic, I think I would just echo that. A lot of the questions around how do you know if adaptation is done appropriately? I would say the easiest answer is really look at the principles of the local led adaptation. I think that it's one of the principles that is it that really allow you to really identify if uh, adaptation is being done right or wrong. Um, my organization was the first youth led organization that endorsed the principles and jumped on board because we really saw how beneficial it is to have such a process like that. And of course, it doesn't mean that that adaptation measure would, you know, protect people, everyone per se, but I think it really reduces all the risks that are known now uh, for the existing uh, or ongoing development of adaptation projects. Can I add to that? Um, so, yeah, I support what Joshua said, but I think also, yes, it's expensive to do a deliberative, inclusive process, 
but it's more expensive not to. And if we implement adaptation that's not being carefully considered from various perspectives, we're likely to result in maladaptation and increasing the vulnerability of many people. So I think that's one thing. And then somebody also asked how we evaluate whether it's um, been... Um, equitable and i think one of the most effective ways is to ask the supposed beneficiaries themselves either during the project or after the project and it's really interesting to see these responses so there might be locally led um, adaptation principles that i fully support but many of these principles have been around for a while in the community-based adaptation space yet we still see the outcomes of adaptation projects not having the desired goals. And we need to work with uh, those people who are supposed beneficiaries to understand their perspective of why and learn from them who actually are experts in that regard. Thanks. Thank you, Gina. Uh, Catherine? Thanks. Um, I agree with Joshua and, and Gina's points. One thing to add, and I think someone also had asked um, a question about making sure workers and communities benefit from the transition. And alongside the financing um, piece, I think having the high level political will and the ambition, both on mitigation and adaptation side, it is absolutely critical to making sure that um, the transitions that adaptation planning is effective and that the communities and workers benefit. Um, and I think that relates also to the question about, you know, how do you make these policy decisions rapidly while ensuring stakeholder buy-in and social dialogue. I think if you have that high level political will to transition and to support people and, and the workers, then um, part, of that, part of that political will and that process should be this co continuous effort to engage stakeholders and to talk to them and to go out into the communities, um, talking to the most vulnerable, as everyone's mentioned on this panel, adaptation is so local um, that we continuously as policymakers need to be talking to those in different states or different cities. Um, but I think it, it's important to put in place policies that are able to be um, tailored to those contexts and also perhaps updated through this process of social dialogue. So even if a policy is put in place quite quickly, um, there's this process of continuing to see, okay, is this actually working for the people? Are we getting the most benefits out of it? And that, in my view, really comes with a high level of political engagement on climate action broadly. And Rebecca? Yeah, um, fully agree with everything everyone is saying. I wanted to add one additional piece to it. Um, Gina mentioned kind of thinking about ourselves as researchers, right? And how we are contributing to the problem or contributing to solutions. One thing that WRI is trying to do, and I know we're not the only ones, um, is not just you know going to communities and local organizations to get their case studies to share, right? But actually paying them to write the case studies and working with them in a much more iterative fashion, so that we're not just extracting their stories, but we are, you know, maybe because WRI is a large organization, um, we have a bigger microphone, but we are trying hard to pass the mic to them so that they are actually the ones who are reporting on what's working for them um, and also paying them to participate in, in projects. Um, it gives our accounting people headaches to do lots of, you know, smaller subgrants, but we see it as absolutely essential to walking the talk um, in, in this area. Totally. Thank you so much, Susanna. Yeah, I just wanted to, to jump in to say that I think this question of urgency that we see sometimes that's used to avoid some of these issues around, you know, inclusion and stakeholders, include a kind of consultations. And whilst the climate crisis is, of course, urgent and escalating, it, it's in a context of many existing kind of socioeconomic problems. So I think that if to kind of to rush to say that it has to be done, you know, tomorrow and therefore we can't do it properly is, as Gina was saying, a kind of a, a false economy, but also that we need to be careful that urgency isn't kind of used in that way to kind of prevent doing doing a full and kind of proper um, process. And I think linked to that, I was also thinking about these questions of how do we know whether what we're doing is effective and right and how far that conversation can take us? Because we are also operating in some levels of uncertainty about what the warming scenario will be and exactly how those impacts will play out. So we can never know absolutely, you know, is this the right thing for this community? But all we can do 
for my position is is to work with them through these locally led principles as to how they feel would best benefit with all the information that they need and then track and evaluate and research later but also we don't let this kind of conversation around you know exactly which metric is best for this situation flop stop the flow of finance and i know that gives the financial people like many headaches as to how to account for their money but i think it's also something we need to be aware of some of these conversations which we also contribute as researchers also serve to slightly stall the progress because we're we're saying it's complex but we, i think many of us are probably also saying let's do it anyway and try and figure out as best we can Thank you so much, everyone. Um, we actually have a lot of questions going happening in the in the Q and A function, uh, but maybe one that keeps coming up um, are about if any one of you could um, suggest uh, which type of uh, if there are any set of parameters or metrics or global assessments uh, one should look for in adaptation projects for them to actually produce equitable and just adaptation outcomes. And a related question is if there are any global assessments or a comprehensive review on of how just an equitable uh, adaptation actions and, and maybe they are mentioning like, oh, by country, if, if there's some, some um, global assessments by country that they could suggest, uh, Rebecca? Yeah, um, just to tie this back to the global goal on adaptation, I put in the chat there, I had forgotten to mention when I spoke that um, locally led adaptation and elements of climate justice, elements that are aligned with it are part of the text for the global goal on adaptation. And where that process is now is trying to look at what indicators should countries be using to track different aspects of adaptation, their implementation? And so this is very much a live question right now. I don't think like the world <laughs> has an answer to it. Um, WI put forth a paper not long ago on what monitoring, evaluation, and learning for locally led adaptation could look like. And I'll pop a link to it in the chat. Um, you know, perhaps that shed, sheds a little bit of light, but as far as I understand, like a global perspective on this sort of global monitoring system is sort of a work in progress right now. Totally agree. Thank you for that. It is true that it's it's just being created and we actually don't agree on, on what just justice in adaptation means really. Um, there's one um, question in the chat from Praveen Kumar to Catherine. Um, what measures could we take to ensure that just adaptation transition benefit not just the technology, but also workers and communities? Sure. Um, thanks. Well, good question. And I think this goes back to a lot of what um, many of us have highlighted already and, and what I said in my first intervention, which is that we don't need different strategies necessarily for helping workers and communities get those benefits in mitigation and adaptation. I think a lot of what we've learned from the US view um, in implementing both our own domestic and supporting international um, efforts to put in place mitigation policies and the social dimension of, of that um, relates, or you know, a lot of those lessons learned are very applicable to adaptation as well. Um, so I guess just three things I would mention, which I think, you know, we've all spoken about a bit before, but the locally led adaptation, the importance of um, work that's tailored to local context, no one size fits all approach to adaptation planning. Um, I think that that is a way to ensure that you're benefiting um, the workers and the communities that have unique needs. Um, a lot of that, the ability to do that, I think comes from social dialogue from engagement of stakeholders, as you know, I mentioned really going out into the communities and seeing what their needs are. Um, also putting into place social protection policies, which I think, if, for example, with our US experience with the Just Energy Transition Partnerships, this has been one that um, I think has maybe been the most difficult to support our partner countries on because it's something countries put in place social protection policies in very different ways. And so helping those countries, um, again, do the social dialogue, talk to their stakeholders and see what's important to then reform or put in place new policies. That's important. It's very hard to do. Um, and then I just, I think the third thing I would say is just to repeat my point about the high political will, um, because that's really what 
drives the opportunities and the benefits for stakeholders the most in my view. Um, sorry, there's a fire truck. I'm not sure if you could hear that. <laughs> and I would say also, I, I think this kind of relates to the points that Gina and Joshua made before, but the ambition has to be on both mitigation and, uh, and adaptation because it costs more, as Gina pointed out, it costs more um, if you, in a, in a higher degree of warming world. And, and um, so I think that the two go hand in hand. It's not, it's not separate. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, Joshua, I think um, the other question is if you could share uh, some of uh, the working initiatives that can bring African youth to this type of conversation. So basically what you've been working on. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, br briefly, briefly, I think that there are many ways this is being done, not just in my organization, but also others. There's one initiative that I'm part of that we started called the Youth Climate Councils. Uh, and this is basically setting up councils to support local government offices including sub-government offices like municipalities that sometimes don't get enough attention and having those councils coming from different uh, stakeholder groups, so young women, informal groups, and having their seats with the municipality leaders uh, or the local government offices and being able to consult with their constituency and bring those inputs in the development of policies. And uh, so far, for instance, in Ghana, they've been able to input to the National Adaptation Plan and the Just Energy Transition Plans, which is very important. Uh, in, and just, I think, yesterday, or two days ago, the mayor of Freetown and the youth movement, they also launched their Youth Climate Council to support the mayor's efforts uh, on, on adaptation to heat, particularly. Uh, so I think those are initiatives that can be very, very important uh, in, in the aspects of, you know, even corporate and businesses. Uh, I, for one, uh, uh, you know, at the very early days, really saw that advisory groups and advisory positions, even though they are just fancy technologies, it's a very good way of getting different uh, uh, marginalized groups to get closer relationship with business leaders and big intergovernmental organization leaders. So I have set up the youth advisory group to the UN Secretary General on Climate. Since then, the, almost every UN entity now has a youth advisory group that brings sort of a few youth leaders to get closer to their work and advise them. We are beginning to do that in corporates, uh, in corporate spaces as well. So you get big companies that are beginning to embrace the idea of having uh, youth uh, advisory groups or even um, different particular stakeholder group like women or, or children or informal workers to be able to advise them. So that is very important. I think when it comes to more uh, uh, negotiation spaces, there are several climate negotiator programs. We do one with UNICEF to support uh, young negotiators in, in specific disadvantaged communities to accompany their national negotiators to COP. Uh, so these are all different initiatives that could be done to support. I think one thing I wanted to mention about the risk of workers not benefiting, and we're seeing this more and more, the challenge is that, you know, when the funding for adaptation or even just transition is somehow uh, locked sometimes, when it gets unlocked and there are big opportunities and the funding starts to flow, the real challenge is that whoever gets that funding and whoever, whoever the funding is coming from comes with these timelines that need to be met. And that is where the funny word or the funny usage of agency becomes so real because then the funding is approved. They want to just go ahead and implement the project and all of a sudden, they would just do it, right, which, which is a real risk. I think that what, what we need to do, uh, particularly for civil society movement, um, is the the advocacy and also the commitment of our own, you know, whatever available resources we have to strengthening unions and trade groups uh, and informal workers in uh, uh, communities where these groups are not very unionized or formalized or sort of uh, uh, structured so that they really have a very strong a force in pushing back on some of these narrative around agency. At the end of the day, they are the main reason. I mean, people who live in these communities are the reason why these projects need to be implemented. So if you cannot consult with them and talk to them, what is the agency you are even referring to, right? But I think it's super important that those groups have that strength, that mandate. And I really agree with that point when you say, you know, these are also people who are displaced who have a million things to deal with on a daily basis, they do not have time to sometimes just come together and organize, right? So how do we make sure that we can support that work? And one thing that the Youth Climate Justice Fund is doing this year is particularly deciding that we will fund groups that are non-climate, but coming from these communities. What are the builders unions? What are the trade unions? What are the informal workers unions? What are the different market women uh, associations that we can actually support? Because typically those are groups that no climate funder would particularly look at 
But if you can get them to come together and say that we don't believe in your national adaptation plan because we don't see how it support us and our exposure to heat on the market. And as a you know, group of 10,000, 15,000, a million market women doing this, that'd be really, really important. So yeah, wanted to share that. Uh, uh, thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, sadly, <laughs> we have only a few minutes left. So I would uh, like to close with a final round from everyone. Uh, if you can summarize uh, in one sentence, uh, what would be the most important takeaway you would like to leave the audience with, um, starting with uh, Susanna? Great, really, uh, off, off the cuff thinking. <laughs> um, I think maybe for me, it's the idea that this global goal is, a, is an overarching framework for us to work within, and it's not going to provide the answers. And so working through something that has got more detailed understanding of process, such as the just transition, could be a way to make sure that some of these issues of inclusion and who gets left in and out is not left behind. Thank you, Susanna. Catherine? Thanks. For me, it's it's just to reiterate that the tools are there to do just transitions to support uh, communities and workers in adaptation planning. It's not that we need anything new. I think it's just thinking about how to use the tools that are there already in perhaps creative ways and, and making sure that stakeholders are engaged, tailored to local context, um, and having that high level of political will. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Dina. Thanks. I guess for me, it's that um, achieving justice is going to be uncomfortable and it's difficult because it goes against the status quo. And the way we've done things is to support those who have resources and power. And it's a big ask. And so we have to fight for it and it won't be easy. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Joshua. Yeah, there's a saying, you know, nothing about us without us. And I think that this saying, we should always think about it whenever we're thinking about a particular constituency of group, country, community, how much are we involved in them in something that we are thinking for them, right? We're thinking to do for them, to support them, but how much of that is them actually being present to say that we this is actually good for us uh, and and you not know, really committing time and, and budget and resources to do that properly is very important because that is what is going to ensure that there is local ownership, there is comfort, there is harmony, there is trust uh, being built through the process. Yeah. Thank you, Joshua. And Rebecca? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I would agree with Catherine that we have the tools we need. And I think everyone on this call and probably a lot of people listening in today have this innate understanding of what we mean by climate justice, just transition and how that is good adaptation, right? That should be the only type of adaptation. I think what we need to do is come together to make a stronger case to those who maybe are not on this call. And those include, for example, policymakers who are looking at the bottom line, right? You know, and are driven by economics. And the economic case for um, just transitions is not altogether there yet. I, I'm thinking more for local climate action, right? That that is, it is efficient, it is effective, it is gonna build more durable results. So I think that's where we still have some more work to do. But it's been a great discussion. So happy to have met you all and to have been part of this. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, and thank you everyone. Um, we have sadly run out of time, uh, but this is only the beginning of this conversation. So we would like to thank the Climate Emergency Collaboration Group and European Climate Fund Foundation for supporting this phase of the South to South project. And of course, I want to thank my colleague Fanny, who did an outstanding job organizing this webinar. And thank you again to our renowned speakers and attendees for joining. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone.